Surangama Chakraborty, our associate professor, to give welcome address. Thank you, ma'am. On behalf of the Department of Forensic Medicine and Toxicology, I'm extremely delighted to welcome you all to today's webinar on the topic medical legal issues in casualty. I welcome our honorable chairman, Mr. J. A. Satish Kumar, sir, to today's webinar. I welcome our dean, sir, Professor Dr. P. Shanmugam, sir, Vice Principal, Professor Dr. B. Usha, ma'am, Medical Superintendent, Professor Dr. N. Mohan, sir, Controller of Examinations, Professor Dr. P. M. Subramanian, sir, Deputy Medical Superintendent, Professor Dr. Kilanko, sir, and Professor Dr. Prasanna Babu, sir, Director of Academics, Professor Dr. G. Dhanushekar, sir, to today's webinar. We would like to extend a special welcome to our guest speaker, Dr. Manivasadam M., Senior Assistant Professor of Government Karun Medical College, Karun, who will be sharing his knowledge with us today. I welcome wholeheartedly all our delegates from different states, Tamil Nadu, Karnataka, Pondicherry, Kerala, and Andhra Pradesh, to all the CRRIs and students to today's webinar. Now I request our respected Dean Sir to address the program. Good morning to everyone. It is a great pleasure to inaugurate this an important uh, webinar. So this is so much important. Uh, everyone know about the importance, but the doctors who was in budding doctors, the house agents and the junior residents, residents, and the persons dealing in uh, uh, this uh, emergency cases must be well versed with the, the medical legal aspects of the treating of patients, their uh, informed consent and informing the uh, description of the injuries and wounds and all. This is such an important topic. It will be very useful to each and every one of you. I congratulate the Department of Forensic Medicine, uh, Professor Vijay Kumar and Dr. Surandam Manis, uh, for organizing such an important topic. And the speaker also, Dr. I welcome Dr. Mani Vasakam from Karun Medical College on behalf of the our chairman and the management for this webinar. Welcome, you, Dr. So, young buddy doctor, and also you uh, share your knowledge with all the all body doctors, it's such an important topic. And I, I needless to say, there's a, the importance of it. And I, if, uh, I request all the delegates to pay attention to the, the this webinar. And it will be much useful to you for your day-to-day -day practice. So not only the uh, government or you know, the private institution also, private practitioners also must know how to deal with this medical legal aspects. That is the area where we are lacking. And most of the documentations and dealing with medical aspects, most of the doctors are not paying much attention. I think this webinar will be very useful to each and every one of the budding doctors who are practicing and they, so without any problem, they say it through their practice. So thank you very much for giving an opportunity. I congratulate the, once again the Department of uh, Forensic Medicine for organizing such an important topic. Thank you very much for giving an opportunity. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Now I call upon our engineer, <coughs> Dr. Vijay Kumari M. Professor, to introduce our guest speaker. Okay, before introduction, I would like to welcome my teacher, uh, Professor Dr. Valin Ayam, sir. Welcome, sir. He's all right. Okay. Okay, on, the, on behalf of Department of Forensic Medicine and Toxicology, Annapurna Medical College and Hospital Salem, it is really a great pleasure to extend a warm welcome to our very talented, young and dynamic guest speaker, Dr. Mani Vasagam, uh, who is working as Senior Assistant Professor, Government uh, Karur Medical College, Karur. And he has accepted our invitation immediately, even uh, in his busy schedule. Thank you so much, Dr. Mani Vasagam. He has completed his undergraduation from Tanjavur Medical College and post-graduation from Tirnal Valley Medical College. He has contributed in uh, Anil Agarwal's textbook of forensic medicine and also in practical forensic medicine book. I feel proud to say that he has established first academic toxicology garden in Tamil Nadu. He has established it in two places. He is nodal officer for medical legal juris jurisdiction separation in Chennai. He is also a NEET PT coach, uh, attached to NEET PT coaching institute 
and we could suppress the concept in a very concise and easy manner for the PD aspirants. He is also a faculty for magistrate training. He is NMC student's mentor and MU faculty in his college. He is also he also has very keen interest in research activities and has to his credit many national and international publications. Okay, welcome you, Dr. Mani Vasagam. And regarding the topic, today's topic, casualty is one of the places where doctors face lots of challenges in man managing your medical legal cases because he has both medical as well as legal duties to do and face lots of hardship. Hence, this topic was selected mainly concentrating the junior doctors, casualty medical officers, uh, CRIs, etc. Hope everyone gets benefited and I wish happy learning to all. Thank you, ma'am. Now I call upon our HD ma'am, Dr. Vijay Kumari M to chair the session. Let's start the session now. Over to you, sir. Thank you all. So first of all, I would uh, like to extend my uh, sincere thanks to uh, Chairman Sir, uh, Dean Professor Sanmugam Sir, and uh, Medical Superintendent uh, uh, Professor Mohan Sir for uh, considering me uh, in this webinar. Uh, also, I would like to thank uh, Usha Ma'am, Vice Principal, and uh, Professor Vijay Kumari Ma'am uh, for having belief in me that I would uh, deliver a lecture successfully. Uh, of course, I would. Uh, uh, not be complete without mentioning uh, the contribution by Valinayagam sir, is one of the doyen of uh, forensic medicine in Tamil Nadu, or uh, even he is well known all across India. So with all their uh, guidance and uh, blessing, I would uh, like to uh, start this session. Oh, is the PowerPoint visible, ma'am? No. Or shall I? No. Okay. Is it okay, ma'am, now? Yes, yes. Yes. Yeah. yes. So, this is the topic today. Medical legal issues and casualty. So, ma Madam has uh, given a big introduction to me. I think I have to make myself uh, deserving for it in future. So, this is the abstract of my presentation today. So, I'll be giving a small introduction. Why should we uh, need to uh, go through all these medical legal aspects? Uh, being a doctor, treatment part is okay, right? So, on the out on the outer layer. But why should we bother ourselves with those legal issues? Uh, I'll be giving an introduction. Then we'll go into the topic proper, medical legal issues that we come across in the casualty. Then the topic will be open to the forum for all the discussions and the doubts. So, see this trauma ward or casualty is the first point of contact between a physician and a patient, right? So, without doubt, I would like to emphasize, without doubt, treatment takes the priority, right? So, treatment of a man in distress, it takes the priority. I have given you the reference, even the Supreme Court judgments, they hold it right. So treatment takes priority, no doubt in it. Secondly, the documentation or medical legal aspect comes. Right? So this is where we have to know a dictum, uh, which is uh, ignorant share juris non excuse So you ignore about those uh, Latin terms at all. I'll say what it is. So it says, if we say we are not aware of existing law, it is not an excuse. So courts won't accept it. If you say, I do not know, uh, this circular was circulated, I do not know. This act was passed, I do not know. We cannot say, I do not know about this particular law. We cannot say, I do, I do not know about this particular procedure. We do not, we, we cannot say, uh, I am aware of this procedure. We cannot say, this is not an excuse. So this will be viewed very seriously. And that is why we have to go in detail about the procedures and protocols we have to follow while dealing with the patient, right? See, a patient might be having an illness, right? If that illness needs a legal remedy from his side, uh, this is where our, our legal responsibility also starts. So I'll repeat, 
treatment starts first no doubt in it at the same time our legal issues our legal responsibilities takes importance because we cannot say i do not know about the law we cannot say i do not know about the procedures right yes so this is why we have to go through all these uh, legal uh, issues uh, with respect to medical practice yes so now i'll go into the topic proper so now we know why should we uh, understand all these issues yes so one thing is uh, medical legal issues with respect to living like uh, persons coming in second thing is medical legal issues with respect to death uh, in casualty right so out of which the sub topics are there so in living will be dealing with uh, making an ar entry or intimating to police or magistrate then comes uh, dealing with survivors of sexual offences more burning burning problem nowadays and third one is uh, drunkenness and fourth one is forwarding of sample those three and four will be uh, less likely encountered uh, scenarios but we'll touch on it so we cannot uh, leave anything right just now i said we cannot say we, i do not know so the next part is uh, medical legal issues in dead so one is body taking care of a body and second is certification of death right the certification of death is quite interesting i'll share uh, some of the stories right so first is with respect to living so when a living man comes right so we we have a book called the ar entry book accident register book yes so this accident register book first i'll tell you why this accident register book is important then we'll go uh, how we have to enter it right so this accident register is the document that a doctor writes or mentions or documents whatever the person says right so a man comes he says i got injured in my right arm so you please take a look at it so now you treat him and then you document the injury right so this is what you call roughly accident register so why this accident register is important this accident register in entry is equivalent to fir and it is equivalent to dying declaration so you might you might remember this nirbhaya case delhi gang rape nirbhaya case so the conviction in the supreme court was upheld solely on the basis of dying declaration and the accident register of course so this much importance is given by courts to accident registers right so that's why our first core topic of interest is accident registers right so it is equivalent to an fir it is equivalent to a dying, de- dying declaration so this this would be an ideal ar entry right so an ideal ar entry would be in this way so first it should have a serial number and you should have institution's name so i'll tell you one experience i received a summons right i received a summons uh, from a place that i have never visited i have never worked i said i never been to that place i never worked there i uh, hardly worked on three or four places i never been in that place so then only i realized by looking at the signature at the at the bottom it was some other doctor in my name it was n maniwasan myself is m maniwasan the so someone was issued to me so this is why i say the serial number institute right and the signature by the medical officer takes the first precedence right so in the body we have to write the identification mark right identification mark right and then the history shall be i'll tell you in a crisp way history should exactly in the same words given by the person or the patient most often we use the word patient but i used to prefer person so a person says a history record it in his own words right in his own words that's why i'm saying it is having importance equal to fir so you have to mention it in the same exact words see if the person gives history in a vernacular language avar tamil la sonnarana tamil la eludalam there is no harm in it there is no mandate to say in which language you have to record you can record in whatever language which is used by the person coming to you you can record in tamil no issues in it right so and the important point is wounds and treatment part see here this is where we sometimes uh, make some uh, mistakes I, i i would not say fail we would sometimes make some mistakes you see you see the wounds mentioning of wounds you should always keep in mind see aberrations sir i aberrations would usually have two dimension right so yeah, whenever we fall down from a cycle or a bike it will have two dimensions length and breadth but we used to write aberration of 2 cm in one dimension right a simple error a simple error of course but it will have a more impact and second is this laceration in incised wounds it should be mentioned in three dimension laceration always would have depth incised wound will always have depth so lacerated wounds and incised wounds 
should always be mentioned in three dimension right and one more i would i would also like to express a, a personal uh, experience of me see my colleague uh, in ent department he has given me uh, a questionnaire a questionnaire from state human rights commission so which questionnaire has got three pages he simply made an ar entry for making an ar entry they have put questions for three pages the point is he examined a person but failed to mention whether it was a laceration or sutured laceration so nhrc has enough document that the concerned person went to a hospital got treated sutured his wound came to uh, our institution for making ar entry now nhrc has a document now the nhrc wants to know whether this doctor is accepting his fault or not now they have a document already they are simply asking a question did you examine the wound wound was in which dimension or what what part whether it was dressed or not if it is dressed would you open it or not so i would like to say it again and again history mention the exact words by the person wounds right what we see if you see something document it exactly right there is no uh, harm in uh, saying it was uh, so and so wound i could not examine it in the casualty so i need an expert guidance so i shifted the patient to uh, er or uh, ot of course you know stab wound or incised wound you would not probe into it right so in such situations also we can document it see i found a wound 3 cross 2 cm incised wound i did not see the depth because the person has to be shifted to uh, operation table and then we have uh, examined it so please document what we see right in exactly how we see right? and treatment part see ar entry we used to write all the wounds right of course right ar entry is intended for uh, documenting all the injuries right but we forget one thing as soon as we see a wound as soon as we see a distress in a man we need to do the treatment first so we have to document our treatment also what we have done so i have treated him as op i have treated him as ip in this ward right so we have to do it and the basic things we do uh, tt injection or uh, taking x ray we can mention it right we can mention it so those things will be also important in an ideal ar entry so ideal ar entry we start with serial number and the name of the institution and id id mark right and then the history and wounds and lastly your signature a clear signature right yes and most often i used to say the entry in any medical legal document should be legible right in legible because after two or three years a document what we have written will be so hard to read by ourselves so if i read at a document it will be so hard for me to read again so it will it should be more legible right yes. so what to write right so what to write in the ar entry so we know how to make an ar entry right in which situations we have to make an ar entry right so this is where the term comes medical legal case right medical legal case so like i have given you in the introduction i'll tell you again medical legal case is one where we treat a man right he would have a legal remedy so the thing would not stop in the hospital it will go to a police station or a court so there would be a legal remedy right there would be a legal remedy yes so so we all know this uh, rock to the twitter sometimes back right this is nesamani so it first is wound wounds of any kind so next is uh, electrical wounds third one is snake bite yes so these are all medical legal cases so wounds of all kind i'll come to it again so electrical wounds electrical wounds of any nature whether it is a uh, household or high voltage or even lightning it includes everything then mechanical aspects yes includes everything so uh, whether it is drowning or hanging or uh, strangulation right and then poisonings all kinds of poisonings including snake bite right see poisoning if you say even drug overdose right also comes under medical legal case right and uh, another thing we should remember always remember in casual cases any brought unconscious any brought dead is to be labeled as medical legal case any brought unconscious you see a man is unconscious 
he is not able to give a history make it a medical legal case right so by the time he recovers you can alter it no no issue you can alter it. the police will come and they will inquire and they'll alter the case the simple hypoglycemic coma they'll alter the case no no harm in it but we should always remember any brought unconscious or any brought dead is to be labeled as medical legal case right medical legal case and lastly Uh, there is one uh, provision for making a medical legal case on the suggestion by the treating doctor right so this will be uh, new to some but it is quite there for a long time treating doctor see we in casualty might might miss few things we might oversee certain things and we would admit the person if on treatment the treating physician or the treating doctor the in charge ward doctor if he says no this has to be uh, a medical legal case if he refers it So we have to make an AR entry. So this is uh, one of the criteria for labeling a case to be a medical legal case on the suggestion of the treating doctor, right? So now I'll come back to the first point: wounds of all kinds. So I told you, right? I'll explain one thing. So it is whether the wound is uh, accidental or homicidal or self-inflicted. It doesn't mean uh, any difference. So you have to make AR entry in all these situations, right? So self-inflicted. Home is either accidental. We have to make accident register, right? Yes. Okay. Now, snake bite. We often miss snake bite to to be labeled as medical legal case, and snake bite is also a medical legal case. Remember. Yes. So this would be uh, an ideal uh, intimation, right? So the purpose of making accident register is to intimate a person who would be. Uh, investigating the case, right? So it would be ninety nine percent. It would be police. Rarely it could be magistrate. so here yes so here i would be uh, telling you one point that would uh, keep you in doubt for a longer time so make it clear see we have to make ar entry for all types of wounds whether whether this is self inflicted wound accidental wound homicidal wound say a person who come to say see i was cutting vegetables at my home i cut my finger this is also an emergency case you have to make ar entry right so now you are intimating the police So for what are all air entry we are making? We are intimating the police. Yes. So this is where the government or uh, legal uh, authorities they give an explanation. If you see a wound, if you see a wound, you make air entry. Right. One step is over. So I tell you again. If you see a wound, you make air entry. Step one is okay. Now come to step two. Step two is intimating the police. Now with step. two if you come to a conclusion that a particular wound is going to end as a simple wound simple hurt the exact simple hurt a simple wound we used to say right a simple wound or gross wound right simple injury gross injury more uh, appropriate word would be simple hurt gross wound. so if you can arrive at a conclusion that this particular wound is going to be a simple hurt only then you need not intimate the police so i'll tell you again All kinds of wounds you have to make air entry, no doubt in it. See wherever you work, whether you are in the government sector or private sector, or you are having a clinic or you are running a OP, whether you come across a wound, you have to make air entry. No delineation at all. So make air entry. So that is step one. Step two is if you can arrive at a conclusion that this particular wound is going to end as simple wound, simple hurt, provided it is self self inflicted. He cut his uh, finger on his own while cutting vegetables. He cut his fingers. So self-inflicted, and that is going to end as a simple hurt. We need not intimate the police. Two criteria are there: self-inflicted, and it is going to end as simple hurt. We need not intimate the police. In all other situations, you have to make air entry. We have to make intimation to the police. So now I'll give you a scenario, right? I'll give you a scenario for you to understand. So the same thing happened in our institution. See, a man says, "I was biting on a stick." House. He was uh, making some the uh, tunika aburu. He was making some rope, so he was biting on some stick. So and then he injured his gums. So now this is self-inflicted. Our uh, air entry is made. Now intimation is not given. Air entry is made. Intimation is not given. So when dental opinion was obtained, dental opinion was obtained. Dentist says there was a fracture, fracture in the teeth. So now this fracture and teeth would go to gross hurt, right? So now police intimation was done, right? So I repeat. So for all wounds, you have to make air entry. You have to intimate the police. No doubt. Only for self-inflicted wounds and 
if the wound is going to heal as a simple wound, we need not intimate the polis, right? If this is the problem. We often confuse. Uh, it, will, it, will get, it will create a confusion in many minds, right? So I hope I have explained it. If not, I'll explain it at the end. If you have more doubts, I'll explain it at the end, right? Now comes intimation to the magistrate, right? So 99% of the times from the casualty will intimate the police, right? So in what situation we need to intimate the magistrate? So one is dying declaration, we all know. For dying declaration, we have to intimate the magistrate, right? Yes. Second is, if you make AR entry on suspected police violence, if the AR entry, the nature of the history, the history elicited is on allegation on, against the police, police violence or custodial violence, then the intimation should be given to a magistrate, not to the police again, right? Yeah, so only these two uh, situations, they give intimation to the magistrate. One is dying declaration. Next is air entry made on police violence, right? So we have uh, finished this air entry and uh, intimation to the police. So now I'll go to the survivors of sexual violence. Right. See, uh, please pay attention to me. Uh, I would like to say, whenever you happen to see a victim or survivor of sexual violence, you have to start treatment immediately. I mean to say immediately because the section 357 CCRPC says immediately, there is no time limit. See, I have given you this uh, paper cutting. You see a doctor suspended uh, in Karnataka, Mysore, it happened. There was a delay of two to three hours. Just imagine a delay of two to three hours, not beyond it. I, when, when I came across this news, I thought, uh, delay, might be uh, five or six hours, or might be half day or one day. Uh, the victim was uh, asked to visit some other hospital, I thought. No, it was not so. The scenario was a delay of two to three hours. The doctor was suspended with the medical counsel, right? So the law says, victim of sexual violence comes to you, start treatment immediately. Again, I stress this point. It doesn't specify government or private or anything. The 357 says, run by a government, run by a local body, run by a private institution, run by a doctor as an individual. Even you are, as such, sitting at your home, a victim of sexual violence comes, as per this law, you have to treat immediately with whatever we have. Right? We cannot offer the same treatment uh, even in a hospital, in a clinic setting. Right? So the crux is, you have to start the treatment immediately, without delay. Right? And second thing is free of cost. Yes. 357 says immediate treatment free of cost. Right. Third is intimate the police. Right. Without delay, you have to intimate the police. Right. And the second example I've given you that. See, this happened in uh, Danubri, where uh, a 17 year old victim uh, was uh, referred from one hospital to another hospital. In the process of referring, they have missed the form. You see, while referring, we used to write a slip. Right. In that slip, they failed to mention MLC, sexual offense victim. So while going to that medical college, they admitted the victim as a non emergency case. And they started treatment and they discharged the girl. So only after discharge, the girl asked for a report of uh, sexual violence examination. They said, we do not know. You are only a non emergency case. So this thing went up, uh, higher up, and all the doctors involved in that uh, scenario were uh, suspended in pending inquiry. So just remember, things are going haywire. If you see a victim of sexual violence, you have to start the treatment immediately, without delay, immediately and free of cost, and you have to intimate the police, right? Yes. Yes, this one. See, this is another practical uh, problem we uh, encounter, where I'll tell you clearly, a victim of sexual violence, if the victim is adult victim, right, adult victim, see, Again, I say 99% of the times victims of sexual violence will be women, no doubt in it, right? So if the victim is a female and an adult, more than 18, more than 18, right? So I stress one point, any doctor can examine that victim. Any doctor, a man or a woman, male doctor or a female doctor, any doctor can examine that victim with proper consent, right? With proper consent. So just remember, an adult, victim of sexual violence, any doctor can examine with proper consent, with full informed consent from the victim, right? See, why I'm stressing you this? Because law says so, any doctor can examine, right? Any doctor can examine. This guideline, even in uh, Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, Central Government website, it says any doctor can examine. Just look at this Bhopal case. In Bhopal, 
there was a girl who went to a medical college and then to a government hospital now the problem is they said you are a woman i am a male doctor i cannot examine you and that victim happened to be a civil service aspirant she took all these guidelines submitted it to the central government and the case started case started against the doctors first and then the accused second right so just remember see all these scenarios are just to make us aware what is going on around us right so what we need to take home is our take home message is adult victim female ask for proper consent inf informed consent if the woman says okay examine any doctor can examine right now scenario second scenario second so please listen carefully scenario second if a female victim is a child less than 18 years less than 18 years now this comes under proxo protection of children from sexual offences act right if the victim is female lesser than 18 years what would happen only a female doctor can examine a female victim remember remember a child victim lesser than 18 years female only a female doctor can examine what would happen if a male doctor examines a child female victim the same protection of children from sexual offences act can be booked against the male doctor just imagine so just, that's why i just wanted you all to know this these two scenarios one is adult victim female any doctor can examine see this confusion this doubt has caused a problem for these doctors in bhopal the doctors had a confusion so whom to examine whom not to examine so because of this confusion they landed up in a problem right so just an academic doubt so it landed up in a problem so have this in your mind adult victim more than 18 with informed consent any doctor can examine right end of story two folks so children lesser than 18 years a female victim only a female doctor can touch the girl remember only a female doctor can elicit history right so third one is drunkenness examination see the drunkenness examination cases have uh, gone down usually at the site itself uh, where the police uh, gets hold of a uh, man ali so, so suspicion uh, uh, suspicious to be uh, drunken uh, they do this uh, drunk drunkometer test even in this uh, spot itself so very rarely very rarely you see very rarely these uh, they would encounter but i would uh, like to stress there is no rare case or so rare case in a medical legal situation medical legal situation all cases are equal so if you happen to see a drunkenness examination case just remember one point you cannot certify a drunkenness examination simply on clinical examination alone now various judgments have come simply on clinical findings we cannot conclude on drunkenness so we have to send samples blood sample and urine sample we have to send, send right second thing is sample forward so this is another very interesting area where should we forward any forensic samples any trace evidence you collect any blood sample you collect any um, clotting even you treat treat a poisoning case you do gastric lavage you can uh, collect the gastric lavage content and uh, you preserve it right so where do you send it that's a problem so whenever we say send it to forensic lab the contents will be packed and forward to forensic medicine so forensic medicine is different forensic science is different just remember forensic science labs would have uh, regional branches in salem there is a forensic science lab in bangalore there is a forensic science lab so in many uh, for three or four districts there will be forensic science lab so take home messages if you collect a sample be it a hair be it blood sample be it urine sample if you happen to collect a sample label it properly write the name of the person who collected it that is your signature right it is mandatory next is we have to send the sample to forensic science lab right i stress you can get the help from forensic medicine but the sample has to be sent to forensic science lab right forensic science lab. one of the practical uh, doubt we always have right so what does uh, disturbing uh, news says a man thought to be dead is found alive on a toxic table is it possible 
not only in India, it happened in Spain also. Three doctors declared a man to be dead, but he just woke up before the cops. Three doctors certified. So what would have happened? See, if we are in casualty, if a broad is brought, we'll make air entry, make it a medical legal case. Yes, that is one thing is over. The first purpose of a doctor, if a dead body is brought to casualty, is to confirm death. Let to confirm death. So you not to worry about the section. I'll quote a section uh, called Section 46 of Indian Penal Code. It says, death denotes death of a human being unless the contrary appears from the context. It means if you say a man to be dead, he is dead unless he gets up from his chair and says, I'm alive. So this is legal definition. So why they cannot legally define death? Because you cannot legally define death. Only a doctor can declare death. Right? See, legally you cannot define a death because only a doctor can define it. See, that much of significance is given uh, for a doctor even in IPC. So our first priority is to confirm that if a man is brought to casualty, we have to confirm that. See, we have thousands and thousands of practical cases. See, even uh, six or eight months back, we had a situation in Salem. Do you remember? An old man, for him, a castle death certificate was obtained and he was alive and he was kept in a freezer box. Alive, kept in a freezer box. Remember that scenario? It happens. It is happening. So first thing is you have to confirm death. So how to confirm that? Simple. You can examine, you can go for pupillary science, you can go for auscultation. Even there is a one-step process for confirming death. Take an ECG. It will give a flat line. Right? So confirming death is the first step. Right? If you encounter a dead body, see, never be callous. Never be callous or never be careless. Just confirm death. That is the first thing. And second thing is protection of identity. Remember, protection of identity of a dead body uh, is uh, a big issue nowadays. It is becoming a breach of privacy to dead. It is becoming a big issue nowadays. See, even in COVID times, this NSRC, National Human Rights Commission, has issued some guidance towards rights of dead. Dead body has rights. Right? Many rights are there, right towards will. Uh, right towards uh, property and all that. With respect to our medical practice, right towards privacy is there. Right towards proper clothing of the body is there. Right, Even a dead body, you have to uh, drape it properly. Right, With respect to this uh, identity, identity uh, protection or uh, privacy protection, just I tell you one example. See, one week back, we had a case, a homicide case, a murder case, brought up to casualty. Now, before those air entries were made and body was shifted to casualty, the victim's photo circulated in WhatsApp. The victim's photo with all the cut wounds, here on the face and neck, all the cut wounds, chop wounds, uh, photo was there, circulating in WhatsApp. Now it created a big land order problem in Garu. And now police wants to know who leaked the photo. Because in crime scene, only police would be there. Police photographers would take the photo. Who leaked the photo? And then we came to know in the casualty, when the victim was brought dead, the dead body would be there in the stretcher. We would not be minding it. We would be saying, yes, I'll come there, I'll come there. I'll come there. I'll see the patient. I'll come there. So by that time, there were some miscreants. Well, they, they could be hospital workers or they could be some uh, relatives or friends of the victim or some miscreants who just wanted a laundry order problem. They just clicked the photo of the victim and shared it through WhatsApp, right? All problems started. So when you happen to receive a dead body, yes, of course, I'm not saying focus on the dead body. See, casualty is there to treat the persons. Yes, no doubt in that, no change in that. We focus on treatment. If a dead body comes, bring the stretcher, keep it, in an isolated place or keep it in a place where we can oversee it so that the dead person's privacy is not breached. So that is the point I want to stress. So dead body, the right of privacy has to be maintained at any cost, at any cost, right? So even now this information technology acts have come, if you click a photo and share it in WhatsApp. So unless the culprit was found, the fingers would be pointing first at the doctor and the casualty, right? Yes. And second thing, another important problem we face is we doctors, we uh, 
label up a case to be a broadbent case and medical legal case and the body has to be handed over to the police not to the doctors if you happen to see a broadbent case broadbent cases have to be handed over to the police a police can decide right i'll come to that in the next slide police can decide what to do but remember police the dead body has to be handed over to the police okay one more practical situation i had see in the delivery hospital of our institution there was a hanging case an attempted hanging so they made the mlc intimate police everything and the relatives said uh, give the body to us we'll take the body to uh, the marshal and we'll proceed with the post mortem examination but what they did was police was not there body was given to the relatives the relatives took the body straight away to the crematorium straight away to the crematorium just before switching on the crematorium uh, funeral pyre police intervened and uh, they brought the body back right so it will cause a huge uh, stress on the doctor you know so just remember only to the police we have to hand it over right the dead bodies right yes so you all would have uh, seen this web series right web series uh, or if not just google uh, for this image and uh, search the web series there will be a line uh, regarding uh, fake death certificate fake death certificate so the facts would not be exact what they try to say is cause of death certificate i said i tell you what this cause of death certificate uh, poses a threat to see a uh, lot of issues happen Uh, one such issue was uh, a doctor was imprisoned for issuing a false uh, cause of death certificate. He was imprisoned in Chennai. It happened in Chennai. Cause of death certificate. So a, a man comes. Uh, see, my uh, grandfather is ill. He's taken ill. He cannot uh, come out. Now he is dead. So please issue him a cause of death certificate. So once a doctor signs a cause of death certificate, it is valid. Just imagine what effects it has. I told you already. once a doctor says a man is dead he is dead unless the man proves himself that he is alive which is practically impossible right how how can i prove myself that i am alive so once a doctor certifies death it stands now this cause of death certificate will be used for registering death it will be used for transferring property it will be used for claiming compensation right lot of things would happen so before signing a cause of death certificate just remember one point did i witness this death did i witness this death did i witness this man to die if you treated him right if you witnessed this death you can sign no doubt if not never ever sign a cause of death certificate right yes second thing is should we write cause of death certificate in a broad death case this broad death should we write a cause of death certificate no we should never write cause of death certificate in a broad death case because we do not know how the man died right see we have uh, cases uh, examples and examples of cases where you see there was a broad death case when i was doing a post graduation i happened to see a broad death case and the relatives were uh, creating a road rupo give give the body back it is only a natural death now the police are not convinced the police says no it is a broad death case it is labeled as a medical legal case we'll do autopsy and then we'll hand it over now in autopsy it happened to be a submental not hanging right it was happened to be submental not hanging case so we would not know what is there right so any broad at case make it very pure legal case and then give the body to police now police can decide whether to subject the body for autopsy or not remember police can decide whether to subject a body to autopsy or not that is police it is under police provision police has the power to decide it is not under the purview of the doctor a doctor can never decide whether to subject a body to autopsy or not right we can label a case as medical legal case one thing next thing is we should never give cause of death certificate in a broad death situation right yes so uh, now it is open to uh, all of you so you can have uh, your doubts or uh, clarifications clear so uh, i thank you once again uh, to uh, dr rajesh kumar madam i hope i uh, made my presentation a little bit useful to you all uh, it is open for questions
uh, he was stressed upon the importance of following uh, law. His ignorance of law is not an excuse. Yes. Hope so everyone understands this. And uh, he was highlighted the common errors and problems faced uh, by the doctors and the various roles of doctors in various medical legal cases like injury, sexual offense, drug and as broad dead cases. Yes, broad dead cases. Many of us have lots of confusion when dealing with dead bodies. You have beautifully explained by giving various case scenarios and also stressed upon the rights of uh, dead which we usually ignore and the importance of uh, certifying and the precaution that has to be taken by dealing with dead bodies and issuing death certificate. It was a beautiful presentation and I have explained it in a very simple manner by giving lots of examples. Hope everyone would have uh, enjoyed your uh, session and uh, we have some questions for you. Yes, ma'am. Yes. As you already mentioned, like uh, if a patient comes to the doctor and the doctor does like a prayer injury, he records all the injuries, and if the injuries are simple, then no need to intubate the police. Fine, sir. But uh, here the patient comes with a history of some cell phone and that he uh, got multiple injuries, and after noting down that injuries are simple, he has recorded it to the prayer injury. But we haven't intimated the police. After two weeks, now patient comes to the police with a complaint of assault. That means telling like previously he has told uh, you haven't disclosed the things. Now he's telling actually he sustained some uh, assault. And uh, now police ask for the this uh, injury certificate. So when he comes to the hospital, now previous doctor is not available. So now we have a new doctor in the hospital. He can issue the injury certificate depending on the injuries which are already mentioned in the air copy. Because already in two weeks the injuries are partially fixed. So can it be possible that different doctor can give the injury certificate depending on the air injury, sir? Ah, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I'll I'll explain it. Uh, it needs uh, some time. Uh, I'll explain it, ma'am. Uh, it will be a lengthy explanation. Uh, ma'am, I think. Uh, See, one thing is clear, madam. See, whenever uh, we see any kind of wound, I stressed on one point. If you see any kind of wound, we are bound to make air entry. We are bound to make air entry. Now, this provision is given just not to overburden ourselves for writing air entries. See, if a man just uh, fell from a bicycle, he has just got an upgraded wound, we cannot write an air entry. So, this will overburden us. Just to elevate our burden, this exemption class was given. So now, and that, that is also only for self-inflicted, not for others. If the history says, for unknown reason, I fell down. Somebody pushed me. Accidentally, I fell down. It is not even for accidents. It is only for self-inflicted, not even for accidents. So it has to be self-inflicted. And the doctor has to be sure that the wound would end up as a simple wound. Yes, ma'am. Like you mentioned, how would we know a wound would end up as a simple wound? Now, this legal provision is that the word says doctor has to satisfy himself that the wound is going to end as a simple wound. Now, we have to calculate this. There is never a slightest chance of this wound is going to transform into a grievous wound. Like I say, if it is a, an aberration, fine, aberration on shoulder or aberration on knee, it is never going to be a, a grievous wound unless we take all the x-rays and all and we are satisfied ourselves. There's a simple abrated wound would never become a grievous wound on uh, body parts. So even if you see a laceration anywhere, there is chance for the laceration to get septic and uh, it would go for uh, grievous classes. So the onus is on us to decide. The onus is on the doctor to decide whether this wound would itself heal as a simple wound or not. Yes, that is a point of, you know, uh, litmus test like. We have to be sure. Right? And third is, uh, what I have understood is, madam, uh, who to give air entry, uh, like who to give wound certificate. See, the doctor who first examined the wound would be in a better position to give wound certificate. Because the idea is, whenever I see a wound, I have a first-hand knowledge. Before the treating doctor sees it, I would be altering the wound. I would be uh, debriding it. I would be applying some ointments or I would be suturing it. Anyway, I'm going to alter the morphology. 
So first thing is I would be having the first hand knowledge. That is, if I am the cash quality medical officer, supposing for the doctor who sees the wound for the first time is bound to make the AR entry. Now, in this point, like if the AR entry, like now I'm coming to this question, madam. If the AR entry is made on the suggestion of the treating doctor, now I'm the cash quality medical officer. I've seen a wound. Now I see, no, this is not a medical legal case. Now I'm labeling it as a non-medical legal case. I've admitted the person. Now you are the treating doctor. Now you say, no, I, I want this case to be a medical legal case. I have observed this wound. So now I want to, this case to be labeled as a medical legal case. Now being a cash quality medical officer, I'll make the air entry because air book will be available only in the cash quality. So only for that convenience, I'll make the air entry. But wound certificate will be issued by you because you only first recognize the wound. So you'll be having the first knowledge because I said there is no wound. So I won't be making any air entry. So only the treating doctor recognized that injury and documented it. So the casualty purpose of casualty in that scenario is only to make air entry. Wound certificate will be given by the treating doctor. So to avoid confusion in the air entry itself, the casualty medical officer can write. Since based on the treating doctor's suggestion, I'm simply making the air entry treatment or, or uh, details of the wound can be obtained from him, you can write. Because once you write the details of the wound, you are supposed to give wound certificate. So you can write the history in such way that I have not uh, seen any, any kind of wound or any kind of uh, history in this case. Based on the suggestion or based on expert opinion from the treating doctor, their entry is made. So for further details, you can you can contact the cashier. Yes, police is uh, having all rights to go go to the treating ward and uh, have a look at the cashier with prayer permission, of course. Right, it will be taken care of, and the wound certificate will be given by the doctor who first seen the wound. I think I've uh, made the explanation. Right. And one more thing, I got to uh, understand is even uh, I had a strange situation in that way. Uh, like you mentioned, madam, in between uh, two, or two lines you have explained, see, a person comes to us, he would say simply, like, uh, I was cutting uh, plants at my home, so I got injured myself accidentally. So we would simply give him some uh, TT, some uh, antibiotics, just I'm treating you as OP, you just go. So after two weeks, he landed up in uh, court, straight away he landed up in court and filed a case, stating that I've given complaint to police Police is not taking action. Take action against the police. Now, this person has got problems with police and his neighbor. Now, where the problem started is, now on court's direction, police filed a case. But police started inquiring the doctor who treated him. Now, police is asking, see, you have seen a patient with a wound. Now, where is their injury? Now, you can claim you did not intimate us because it is only simple. But where is the air entry first? Right? See, 99 percentage of these cases, we would treat it as OP. No doubt in it. Even, even I do it. Even everybody does it. But the problem here is we have to start revising our procedures. We have to start revising our protocols because uh, public is not, uh, you know, they are more aware of legal uh, rights and all than us. So we have to be more uh, aware of what is happening around us. So for any kind of wound, making air entry is absolutely mandatory. Even law says it. Uh, medical uh, manual says it. So when you see a wound, document it. So and then uh, fortunately, uh, the doctor did not have any record. And the, uh, the treating doctor did not have any record. Fortunately, the patient, he delivered the OPC to police, stating that I have taken treatment. So this what do you say? This pulled the doctor out of the misery. So if not, the doctor should have given some proof that he has uh, so-and-so person went, uh, went uh, inside and he treated him because the case was uh, booked as uh, attempt to murder. And he is the accused. He is not the victim. He is the accused person. The case was attempt to murder against him. Now, doctor has to say whether he treated him or not. So he is not uh, getting anything. So fortunately or unfortunately, uh, the person submitted the OPC. We do not know for, for what idea he has submitted. Uh, if not, the doctor would have ended in a serious trouble. So these things also happen. So that's why I repeatedly say, you see any kind of wound, we have to make an air entry, whether to intimate the police or not. So only self-inflicted, simple wound, not intimate. But we, have, we need to have the entry. Yes, ma'am.
Yes. There are some questions in chat box, I think. Ah, yes, ma'am. Yes, uh, I got uh, one question from uh, Sudha R. Uh, very interesting. Okay, thank you. Uh, it is not a question. Whether a doctor in a clinic can reject the yes, uh, whether a doc in a clinic can reject the person if they see MLC. No, no, you cannot, doctor. You cannot. You can never reject a person in distress. See. Um, one thing is, so I tell you two, two important points. One point is, if you see an emergency, being a doctor, you are bound to attend. Medical Council of India, sorry, NMC says so. No, NMC says so. Code of Ethics says so. If you see an emergency, you are bound to attend. Right? See, this is not to be confused with right to choose a patient. Right to choose a patient is different from our bound duty in emergency. If you see an emergency, you have to attend. That is different. Right to choose is, now he has got some other option. If you are not treating him, he has got some other option. Now this right to choose a patient, you can exercise if he, he is not following your instruction. If he is not following what prescription you give, or he is not uh, behaving in a proper way to you. It is uh, affecting your dignity. In that case, you can choose a patient. That is different, but you are bound to attend. And second thing is, I told you, and even uh, Professor Rujik Mari, Madam, has emphasis, emphasized on it. You cannot say, I do not know, with respect to legal procedures. You cannot reject a person simply because it is a medical legal case. It will become a big offense. It will become loss of evidence, 201 IPC, right? You can never reject a person or a situation claiming that it is a medical legal situation. See, there is no situation called a medical legal situation, right? If you understand it in a, in a simple way, it is not at all a situation called a medical legal situation. It is a medical situation that has got a legal link or a legal continuity. Right? It is a legal continuity. So you can never reject a case to be medical legal case. So I, I quoted you examples. A victim was referred from one hospital to another hospital or four doctors were suspended. It happened in Dharmaburi, happened in Bhopal. Right? It can happen anywhere. Right? So you can never reject a medical legal case. And if you reject a case, how would you know whether it is a medical case or a medical legal case? Right? So, yes. So, yes, sir, if we don't have any female attendant near, can't we deny examining female survivor of sexual offense? Yes. See, this is a nice question, of course. See, I'll tell you one thing. With informed consent, with informed consent, you can examine a female victim, no doubt. In it. it is preferable to have a female attender with you. Preferable. If it is not there, no harm. No harm. There is no mandatory uh, rule for having a female attendant. That female attendant presence is just to protect the dignity of the doctor. If there is an allegation arise in future to protect us, a disinterested third party provision is there. But for treatment of sexual violence, never take anything for granted. A treatment of sexual violence, if a woman presents to you and says, I have been sexually assaulted, start treatment immediately. Ask for consent, examine immediately. Right? All these things would become irrelevant. Right? Because CRPC says so, without delay. Right? So, in otherwise situations, in a different situation, if you examine a woman, always examine in the presence of a nurse or in the presence of a one of his uh, relatives or attendant, that is different. From a medical legal standpoint, from a victim of sexual violence, and if the victim has given informed consent and you have documented the consent, there is no need. If you cannot find a female attender, there is no harm. Only in this situation, right? In this situation. And uh, ah, there is one more doubt. The snake bite cases require information to police. Uh, labeled as MLC. Yes, yes, definitely. 
uh, snake bite cases need to be labeled as a medical legal case and it has to be intimated to police. See, why, why is it so means? Uh, see, I've gone through some manuals and I've gone through some uh, police standing orders. They do not mention uh, snake bite as medical legal case. But uh, our medical code mentions snake bite to be labeled as medical legal case. And when I talk to some professors, they give me, uh, you know, a hilarious reply. They say, see, snake bite cases uh, come under uh, compensation by government. Government compensates you. Right? If a victim dies in snake bite, government compensates. So what happens is, whatever death happens, uh, people tend to claim the death as snake bite case. So sometimes back the government issued a circular that uh, all snake bite cases has to be labeled as medical legal case, and you have to subject the body for autopsy to uh, uh, elevate this uh, false claims. Yes. One more uh, scientific explanation you give us: a uh, lot of uh, homicidal uh, attacks can mimic snake bite. This uh, uh, sui uh, homicidal abrus, uh, this arrow poisons can mimic snake bite. Uh, even though it is out of context, it is scientifically right. Uh, you cannot take uh, take it for granted uh, for this uh, situation. So snake bite cases, you have to intimate the police. All poisonous stings, uh, scorpion sting, uh, bee sting, you have to intimate the police. See, bee sting, you can make air entry and wait. If something happens to the person, that is, if he collapses or dies, you have to intimate the police. Uh, three days back, we I did a case on uh, multiple uh, wasp sting. Kadandu, kadandu, it will be prevalent in Tanjavur. So, so, see, fortunately, you know, they uh, did some uh, fire. And uh, one uh, person happened to be physically challenged. So, he could not run. So, all the uh, wasp uh, bite him on his face and all. So, he developed uh, anaphylaxis and then he died. So, in this scenario, even though uh, snake bite and scorpion sting, air entry, intimation to police. It is routine. The bee sting and wasp sting, you know, wait for, uh, make air entry, uh, wait for recovery. If he is recovered, okay. But if he is dead, uh, you have to intimate the police. No doubt about that. Uh, yes. Question on poisoning case. Yeah, poisoning case. Even though we know MLC should be registered, most of the family members has been my request us to not to register MLC in a poisoning. Where we know that it is only a small amount which was consumed will be a life threatening. Yes, yeah. Uh, see, um, I told you, see, the same example. Uh, we would not know what poison it is and we would not know what concentration it is. Fine. See, if you say oh, what a few grams would do, I would say a few grams of sani uh, it is not prevalent in other parts of Tamil Nadu. Even in other parts of Tamil Nadu, if you say, Sani Pura, Sani Pura, Sani Pura, Sani Pura, Sani Pura, Sani Pura, but it is potentially toxic. Even a few grams, you cannot even think of uh, reviving. A whole body will be stained as yellow. The arm and die will stain the whole body yellow. You would never imagine this is going to be uh, a life threatening. A few grams, even a few milligrams. What would you do if it is happened to be Sani? You would not know. Of course, the patient would have collapsed by that time, but we would not know what sort of poison it is and under what situation it was consumed. See, I tell you again and again one thing. It is the duty of the doctor to label a case as a medical legal case or not. It is not choice of the doctor. It is our duty. It is our duty to label a case as a medical legal case. And now I tell you, if you believe in your full uh, academic decision that this poison, you have seen the poison, you have monitored the patient, and you are absolutely sure this within one or two hours, the person is going to be uh, running back to home, and there is nothing uh, wrong in it. And then you can withhold intimation to police. Again, I'm telling you at your own risk. At your own risk. What will happen if the poison happens to have a delayed effect? And the man succumbs to the poisoning on some later day, or three or four days. See, even you take uh, acids, a man consuming uh, some uh, 10 or 15 ml of acid, at the time of admission, he would be normal. Even at the time of discharge, he would be normal. Only during the end of 7 to 10 days, he will have perforation, he will collapse, and then he will be brought back to you. It can happen, right? So, there is no 
choice for labeling a caste medical legal case. So it is your duty to label a case as a medical legal case, right? Yes. So you can withhold intimation at your own risk. I'm telling you again and again, you can withhold intimating the police at your own risk. But don't take that risk unless you are absolutely certain, unless you have monitored the person for some hours and you can elicit history from the concerned individual itself. Right? Then you can consider withholding the intimation for some time. Right? Yes. You can issue cause of death certificate in broad death cases. Uh, yes, well, who who can issue cast out a certificate in uh, broad net cases? Yes, nobody can. Only uh, a doctor who does autopsy can uh, write a cast out a certificate in that scenario. Otherwise, you cannot give cast out a certificate in a broad net case. So the broad net cases has to be subjected to autopsy for obtaining a cast out. Death. That is the only legal solution available now. But what the problem is? Police has the power to decide whether to subject a body to autopsy or not. So we are labeling a case to be a broad dead case and we are declining signing form 4 or form 4 a. Depending upon the situation, we are declining uh, to fill up a cast of certificate. Now the relatives would go and uh, make or convince the police. A police will give a letter, give the body back to us. We don't want any autopsy, right? You can give the body back to the police. In this situation, nobody can give cast of certificate. Nobody can. So in a broad dead case, if the body has to be subjected for autopsy, the doctor who performs autopsy can fill form four, or he can simply give the postmortem examination certificate. Both are correct. He can issue the postmortem examination certificate, or based on his postmortem examination findings, he can fill the cast of death certificate. Otherwise, nobody else can give cast of death certificate in broad dead situations. Victim is not giving consent till the doctor will be penalized for not exactly or treating the patient. I think no, 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 never, never, never. If a victim has not consented, you cannot even touch her. Be a male victim or a female victim. So the victim has not consented, it is not our uh, duty to attend to them, right? So they have not consented. See, now. Uh, there is a, a hidden thing in it. See, a victim has not consented means already the victim has come to you. So the consent is for, uh, I, I understand the consent is for uh, medical legal examination. See, there are two things. If a victim comes, they have to start the treatment. See, the law says, see, be, be clear, I'll explain it. The law says, start the treatment without delay and then intimate the police. So you have to start the treatment immediately because once the victim comes, it is for treatment. Now you get consent for, one is for treatment and second is get the consent for medical legal examination. So a victim can give consent for treatment. At the same time, she can refuse consent for medical legal examination. Now you cannot do medical legal examination, but you have to intimate the police. Now, this, look, this might look uh, confusing, but I'll tell you again. You need consent for two things. Consent for medical examination, consent for medical legal examination. At any point of time, I would the victim can say no. The victim says no, you have to stop. The victim says no for medical treatment, you cannot treat. A victim says no for medical legal examination, you cannot do medical legal examination. Over. Now, you have seen a victim of sexual violence. Now, you have to intimate the police. See, treatment is different, intimation is different. So, treatment, you have two parts. One is you have treat, for treatment, you need consent. For medical legal examination, you need consent. Right? It can be taken as two separate entities. Now, victim has consented for two. Then, no issues. Victim has consented for only one. You have to do the one part, leave the next. Now, victim has not consented for treatment as well as medical legal examination. What, what should we do? You can say, yes, yes, ma'am, you can go. And you have to intimate the police. See, I have seen a victim of so-and-so age. I do not know her name. Roughly this much age, uh, in a this much state. So, I am intimating you. You take further action. Right? Thank you, Dr. Yes. Manimasagam. It was a yes, excellent session. And yes, uh, we explained the questions uh, very beautifully. Hope everyone would have uh, 
really they would have benefited and uh, we have a small uh, certificate of appreciation for you please accept it yes sir yes sir Few few more doubts are coming, ma'am. Let's see. Okay, we can answer two more questions. Ah. I say is uh, role of. Uh, so one doubt I see is it is there in the question answer. Already emergency register case referred to other hospital. What to do? Yeah, register. See. If you register a medical legal case and you refer a medical legal case to some other hospital, you have to uh, attach a copy of VR, copy of VR, or to make a Xerox copy of VR, and label it as medical legal case referred to the next hospital. For the hospital receiving it, for the hospital receiving it, see you can do two things. One is mention the AR number. Right, mention the AR number documented in the previous hospital. See, AR entry made in so and so hospital. Number, date, details attached. I concur the opinion. It is right. Or if you happen to see some other injuries, you make a fresh AR entry. Two things are possible. One is write the old AR number. See, uh, Annapurna Medical College AR number so and so in, in such date. I have uh, attached the document. Uh, same history and uh, examination. Same findings. Now admit in such and such ward. That is one option. Second option is if you happen to see some other wounds, document this wound and then admit. See, there is chance. There is chance for injuries while referring. Right? See, I did an autopsy on one case where a person was treated and referred from one hospital to another hospital. One entry, AR entry was made in the second hospital. Second AR entry was made, and when he was referred from second hospital to medical college. He ended up in second accident and then he died. Now, while doing autopsy, the injuries would never correlate with any of the air entry, right? So it happens. So two things are possible. One is we can mention previous air number, or two is we can make fresh air entry, right? Only thing you should always remember is once a case is labeled as medical legal case, you should never change it to non medical legal case, right? That is you should remember. And second is uh, I think this is the last question. So role of revenue people in. Uh, Filling a cast of death certificate. See, ma'am, I uh, understand this to be cast of death certificate has to be signed only by a medical attendant because the form four will have uh, not have a medical practitioner or uh, some designation. The form four would have under signatory column sign of medical attendant, which means only a person who has attended his illness can sign. So revenue people they are. Even a doctor cannot sign a form four unless we have witnessed it. So how come a revenue people would sign? They cannot sign cast of death certificate. But I told you a situation where police would differ. They would not subject the body for autopsy. Instead, they would take the body to them. So in these situations, are deaths happening at home? An old, uh, some ninety years or ninety five years, no illness or uh, anything dies at home. Domiciliary deaths. In those situations. The revenue into revenue people can write form two that is for intimating the death. See, even in a hospital, we write two forms. One is form four that is cast of death certificate, and form two. Form two is intimating the municipality or intimating the corporation, as the case may be. So these revenue revenue people or revenue officers can write form two. So that is given even in DPH circular. It was given in a clear way. So form four they cannot fill. They have to give only form two. But the problem is the municipality uh, health inspectors won't understand the difference between form four and form two. All they need is form four, so they would ask some doctors sign in form four. That is the practical problem we face. So by protocol, form four only be medical attendant. If it is not possible, only through post mortem examination. These two situations never meet. Nobody else can sign form four. Only form two. That is intimation to municipality. Death intimation to municipality can be signed by a police inspector or a revenue officer, as the case may be. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. It was a nice experience to me also. Thank you. Here comes your certificate of appreciation. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am.
So I express my sincere thanks to all the professors and uh, all the senior colleagues uh, and participants uh, for uh, bearing with me all this time. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Thank you. And I now request uh, Dr. Surangama to give the vote of thanks. Thank you. As we have come to the end of this webinar, it's my duty to give a vote of thanks on behalf of Department of Forensic Medicine and Toxicology, Annapurna Medical College and Hospital, Seno. At the outset, I would like to express my gratitude to the Lord Almighty for his blessings upon us. First and foremost, I would like to express my sincere thanks to our Honorable Chairman, Mr. J. A. Satish Kumar, sir, for encouraging us to conduct this wonderful session today. I extend my sincere thanks to our Dean Sir, VP Ma'am, MS Sir, DMS Sir, Director of Academics, the CON Sir, for their continuous support and guidance. My special thanks to our guest speaker, Dr. Manivasadam M, for accepting our invitation in his busy schedule and for delivering such an excellent and informative speech. I would like to acknowledge my thanks to our technical team headed by Mr. P. Rajendran, IT department, for helping us in arranging and smooth conductance of this webinar. My sincere thanks to all the participants.